Hey there, listeners, and welcome to another episode of our Station One. That's right, folks, we're back, and we have a great one for you tonight. We are starting Halloween early, and we are going to be looking at the 50th anniversary of The Exorcist. That's right, folks, the movie that scared the hell out of me as a kid now just scared the hell out of me as an adult. So thanks, Mike, for picking this one. It's pretty awesome. And it's going to be a great crew to talk all about this one. It's a William Frickin expedition, and it's going to be a lot of interesting stuff because we got a great crew here. Let's introduce, of course, Mr. Mark Maddox is here. Toodles. How's everybody go- doing? Good, Mark. And we have yep. Rebecca Perry joining us. Hi. Happy Halloween, everybody. Joining us for the very first time, of course, Burke Saul is here. Welcome. How are you? Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, dude. Um, Appreciate it. And do you want to introduce yourself? Let people know who you are. This is your first time on the show. Oh, I don't have anything prepared. I need to do some research. Um, (laughs) Okay. (laughs) um, I don't know anything about me. So So I'll take over. Anyway. (laughs) How's that? Yeah. This is going to be good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, give them a few of your creds. Give them a few of your creds, Burke. Um, I don't know. I just, I like what, what kind of credit? Okay, let me help like, you here. Heroes. You worked on heroes. Yes. Agents of shield. Just throw yes. some of that oh, out oh, there. Mo- like movie TV. Yeah. Spread I worked on Hellboy. Yeah. I worked on team America. I worked on, uh, the, I worked, I, I worked on star Wars and I can just leave it at that without explaining what star Wars I worked on. Um, <laughs> I worked on I worked on a lot of stuff out here. I'm old. I have many, many credits. <laughs> That's awesome. So, you know, maybe Maddox won't be the oldest one on the show now. No, just kidding. Actually, I no, think it might be slightly older than me. Wow. I might be, yeah. Okay. De- so. December 61. What about you, Burke? Yeah, I used to babysit Maddox back in Tallahassee <laughs> <laughs> when I was going through my first divorce. Yeah. They used to say, go out in the traffic. Yeah. yeah. Just Run go out along. there. Have a good time. Toddle <laughs> along. It explains <laughs> so, so much, of course, of course. And of course, we couldn't do the show without Mr. Mike Gordon. Howdy, howdy. Yep. Uh, hey. Autumn is here. So that means it's spooky season. Oh, it is. It is. It's going to be a ton of fun. We got a lot of great things lined up for us this year. So I'm we looking do. forward to what you're going to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is the first of four uh, Countdown to Halloween episodes we're going to bring to you. So uh, without further ado, let's get right to it because we want to talk all about, there's a lot to talk about with the Exorcist uh, celebrating its 50th year this year, which is absolutely amazing. Uh was uh, a, actually 1973, but I think it came out like, didn't it wasn't actually, re- yeah, it was released in December of 73. So it's not quite 50 just yet. Uh, but, um, just a yeah, smidgen. just awesome. a smidgen. Yes. Awesome. And awesome. Certainly, uh, a movie that I saw, I didn't see it in the theater. I will admit, um, I saw it, uh, when I, I was much too early I think, to, to see it, I was much too young to see it when I saw it. Um, and I, but I believe I saw it on TV and to this day, like when I watched it this past weekend, there are scenes that shock me because I don't, I didn't remember those when I, when I first saw it on TV, of course, because it was edited, but even edited down, it, it scared the bejesus out of me. Um, So uh, Rebecca, let's go to you first. Where where did you first see, when did you first see the exorcist and what sort of impact did it make on you? Um, I also saw it at probably way too young of an age on broadcast television. And um, I remember being, again, really freaked out that a, there was, they were even showing anything like that on television. And I mean, I must've been 10. So (laughs) again, not the age, you know, that one should probably be watching the exorcist. But then again, I mean, I remember watching night of the living dead when I was five. So I I turned out fine. (laughs) Yes, you did. So much into your behind the scenes so this explains so much about you Rebecca I yeah it probably does um I do distinctly remember you know because this was broadcast television it had one of the best dubs that I've ever heard I don't know how what I'm allowed to say on the podcast if I can use you know swear say words whatever you want if it's bad so, you know the very famous scene where Reagan is you know 
cursing at the priests and you know, she says your mother sucks cocks in hell was dubbed over for broadcast television by her saying your mother sews socks in hell yeah, <laughs> yeah i remember that and i think I it was your lie. mother still rots in hell and it was actually done by it was done by william friedkin he actually tried to duplicate mercedes mccambridge's voice when, he, when they did the dubbing really? did, Wow. Yeah, I it's smart a, it was so socks and hell. But I think that, that was a was Saturday so Night Live skit. They did a Saturday Night Live Maybe. parody of it, and that was the Your Mother So Socks and Hell. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, I can gotcha. see that. Yeah, both are both are good though. But yeah, yeah both uh, both work. <laughs> <laughs> and and either one is still creepy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Still, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> still creepy. Uh uh Burke, what about you? What was your first uh exposure to The Exorcist? I read the book and uh, I remember just being obsessed with horror movies when I was a kid, when I was, you know, way too young. I you know, couldn't wait to see all those movies, The Omen and The Exorcist. And I wasn't able to see The Exorcist. And um, when it first came out, of course, because I was a little bit too young in, in, in theaters, but I think I saw it pretty pretty soon after and i believe mark and i determined that maybe we saw it together first at the for, more, like the, more I, the first time i saw it was at the more auditorium at over at fsu and yeah, you think, were like hey the exorcist is playing and i'm like uh, okay <laughs> and then we went and it was like and it was the same year we saw night of the living dead and i was like okay you yeah. know and i was like went there scared <laughs> crapless and uh it was and, back when a movie could still do that to you you know where sure. you where it was like an it was it was like an endurance test kind of a thing like going to we went there and saw texas chainsaw massacre as well so the yep, exorcist was right. in that that group Luster. of movies where it was like your palms are sweating going into the yeah. theater you know yeah mm -hmm. and you face the dragon yeah and you and you feel great and then later when you've calmed down you start to look at this stuff and go there's some real great artwork. There's great art in these. Yeah. You know, it, so. it got me interested in movies more than I already was. I, it got me into the, the idea of how, you know, how it was so powerful for me and it just stuck with me. And I, my, my brain started asking all those questions like, why is it so powerful? What about it was, um, what was it about this film how, how it was constructed how it was written how it was acted how it was composed and blocked out i mean what was it that made it so powerful and i think that's what you know led one of the movies that led me down this uh terrible path that i've been on ever since <laughs> and, and mark that was your first time seeing it as well yeah yeah, yeah. um i I mean, I was blown away by it. Uh, it was intense. It was scary. But, you know, it's sort of like getting on the roll. You know, there's people that want to be on roller coasters and they 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 do it. They get done and they get off and they go, I, I survived. And, you know, um, <laughs> it, that and Alien and Chainsaw and all that other stuff, um, you you go through them. And then, and then you get sort of, uh, I don't want to say jaded, but it's like, okay, I've done, you know, how bad can, can anything be anymore? So you sort of sit there and go, yeah, okay, let's, well, we'll watch this now. But that one was, <laughs> that one is still, even tonight when I watched it again, um, I felt that the documentary style of it still makes it the best modern horror film, in my opinion, with The Shining. And just, I have to say, Ellen Burstyn <laughs> makes that film for me in so many ways. She, she oh, is... Yeah. Very so absolutely in intensely good in that film and just an absolute real person and that for me is what really sells movies like this it's an i mean when you think about it it's a fairly absurd idea but when you populate your absurd idea with these actors who who have such gravitas and and realism and I mean, you immediately, I mean, the first time you see her, you immediately believe that she's a real person. She's an actress in, uh, yeah. you know, and this is her daughter and this is their life. And the way she relates to the people that she works with is so realistic. And, and her, her presence in the film is so powerful. That's what makes the absurd parts of it. You buy it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. Like, like with my kids, I, I, I said, Hey, lab rats, come here. Yeah. And they sat down and they, uh, <laughs> we're going to finally watch the exorcist. 
because I had shown like Ava a YouTube clip when she was 10 and and uh, Mercedes McCambridge's voice where she goes, uh-huh. and Ava just stood up. Uh-huh. I swear to God, the only thing that didn't happen is her hair turned white and she slowly walked out of the room like, nope, ain't going there. <laughs> uh, they're about like 16 or 17 years old or whatever, and they're watching it. And when the movie was over, I said to the kids, I said, okay, what? Did you like it? Yes, we absolutely liked it. What was the best thing about it? First off, the mom. That was the first thing that they said. Wow. Yeah, that, that, that's really cool. Um, Because I've seen so many, you know, because like with a lot of, this happens with so many groundbreaking classic movies is that, you know, 50 years later, when I see people talking about them now and discovering them now, young people or whatever, they're just like, oh, it's boring. It's this, it's right. that, it's tame. I don't see what the hype was about, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm watching it this weekend and I'm like, it still works on every level that it's supposed to. I don't know what people are complaining about. Um, Mike, what about you? What's, uh, what was your first experience with this one? Actually, my first experience with it was Mad Magazine's take on it. <laughs> actually, <laughs> So I, I got to experience that way. And, you know, I thought, oh, this looks weird and scary about demonic possession and such. And as I've mentioned many times on the show, you know, I basically grew up in front of the TV. I, you know, my parents, you know, that was our babysitter, you know, was HBO, was early versions of cable. And The Exorcist happened to be on. And my parents were out for the night. And so me and my sister, who was like six years old at the time, and, you know, maybe even younger, I think she might have been five. And um, we watched it and cause this was like 1975, 76. So it was the night HBO put the warning on the beginning or the, the, yes. the, the statement. Oh, I yeah. remember that if HBO has to put a statement on, you know, you're in trouble. Yeah, Exactly. Wow. You know? So we watched the uncut <laughs> version of it that they showed at the movies. And my sister ran screaming <laughs> out the night. The, at the vomiting scene. Yeah. And it was just like she ran out. She's like, uh-uh, I'm out of here. And I watched the whole thing scared. HBO. And I slept probably for the next month with the lights on in my bedroom. And that's how much it affected me. And like Mike said over the he watched it over the weekend. I hadn't watched it probably in a good 20 years. And I watched it today and during the afternoon. And still had the same effect on me i was riveted i could not look away it yeah. was so good and there were parts where i wanted to, my, my stomach felt like it was going to come up and it was just like all right i'm out of here you know type thing that's and, and probably not just the possession ones because the hospital and the, the testing scenes are almost just oh, as what they were doing to pull unnerving <laughs> That is actually the scene that more people said, you know, the thing about people fainting and throwing up and stuff, the scene where they stick that thing in her neck and a little squirt of blood comes out, more yeah. people threw up or passed out or ran out of the place because of that, because we can, I've seen people do, I cut my finger one time, this guy turned, big old tough guy, turned completely <laughs> green and just put his face towards the wall and just, I thought he was just going to die. Some people just can't take it, you know? Mm-mm. No, well, and just the just the scariness, I mean, of, you know, if you've ever been in a hospital and just the scariness of all those machines, and especially if you're a little kid and you don't really understand what's yeah. happening to you and, you know, what's going on. And um, yeah, that that actually kind of upset me, like rewatching it, that upset me more than any of the demonic stuff, because I could relate to that bit, like, you know. That, you know, I understand being afraid of that, like the, you know, the demonic thing, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm not it, a religious, well, I'm not a religious person. So that is right. sort of more fantasy to me, but yes, like yeah. the, the, the more medical stuff and the just not understanding and, you know, and then the mom, you know, be, feeling so helpless, you could see in her sitting with yeah. all these doctors and no one can tell her what's wrong with her daughter um sure. that was that was you know very i thought again ellen burston it was incredibly powerful to watch her to me yeah. that's the that's the visceral part of this film is the fact that someone you love someone an innocent child your your child you know you're and some to me those are the films where there is this visceral horror that's inherent in it where you have something like rosemary's baby where your beloved husband is 
doing something really is he really doing this you know and you don't really you realize i don't know this person and with this film it's the it's it's that with the daughter and she feels that something has changed in her daughter and there's a you know it's that that to me is the visceral part of the horror is the is that realization that this person that you love and trust that that they have all those early scenes where they're sort of you know cuddling together in the bed and talking about her birthday party and all this stuff and you really get a sense of the mother daughter love and the how close they are and how natural they are together and when it starts when that thing that something that happens when you know when people get like maybe alzheimer's or something or go through some yeah. sort of a a change and it is heartbreaking and and profoundly disturbing and i think that's that's what ellen burston really portrays in this too is that what you were saying that helplessness of seeing your daughter yeah. become a thing and she doesn't know what's happening and what to do she can't help and, her and, daughter and when and i was nobody... a, when i was a little kid i walked into I, it was middle of the night me and the wife are asleep we hear this massive scream in the next room i run in there and my daughter the entire weight of her body is on the back of her neck her entire torso legs and everything are straight up in the air her head is like this and her the rest of her body's up like that and she's kicking and she's screaming get away from me god damn it get away from me and i walk in and i'm like what in the i mean i'm ellen burston I'm, I, I should put on the dress and get the bouffant hairdo i mean <laughs> and i'm like what the hell and and, and then it was like uh, and you, i couldn't wake her up couldn't wake her up tried to you know what I'm and then finally she calmed down An hour later we're in bed same thing happens again and i'm like what is going on and something said this sounds like a horror story you read one time night terrors so I went downstairs to the internet, blah, 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 typed in night terrors, and sure enough, everything was described. It's a dream you can't wake somebody up from. They lose it. They're freaking out. You can't wake them up and everything like that. Never happened again, ever. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. For yeah. That. God yeah. That's, that's terrifying. It was. The um, After uh, I watched the movie this weekend, I was doing some more research, and uh, I saw an, a review by uh, Pauline Kael and who wrote at the time, of course, she was horrified by the whole movie uh, and not in a good way. And one of the, her criticisms was that you never really get to feel the 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 what what Reagan and her mom are going through. And I was like, I don't know what movie you watched. And and maybe no. that's true of that. Maybe that's true of Reagan, because Reagan is possessed through 85 percent, 90 percent of this movie. Don't get um, started on but KL, as far as as what, you know. Chris McNeil, uh, Ellen Burstyn's character is going through like I feel for her the entire time. Um, and uh, that scene, what really impressed me this time, the scene between her and uh, Kinderman, the cop, Lee J. Cobb, where she figures out as she realizes that her daughter killed this guy, her, you know, the director. And. I mean, the w look on her face, the work that she does on that scene is top notch. I mean, Fantastic. that's that is. Yes, it's brilliant. It's um, one of my favorite scenes in all of cinema, actually. Just yeah. the, the, the yeah. subtleties in that with her and him, the way the camera slowly pushes in on her and then it slowly pushes in on him. And then after they've hit that resolution, the camera starts slowly pulling away from her and away from him. <laughs> yeah. And there's a scene where she turns away from him with the teacups and they they sort of rattle together. And she gets this look on her face like it's giving her pain, like she's thinking, is is Reagan going to hear this and wake up, you know, and. Mm. And that look on her face, too, that that when she asks him, does he want some more tea? And he says. Yes, I think I do. And you know, it's she like, didn't want, she just wants him to freaking leave. And he's yeah. like, Yes, I think I will have some more. And she's like, Okay. You know, <laughs> it's so nicely done. That scene. he should have won an Oscar for this role. Um, absolutely. Yeah. It's so well, I mean, I know that was she her, nominated? Was she even nominated? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. She, yeah, yeah. she was nominated. Yeah. Who, oh, yeah. who it was her and Linda Blair both got nominated, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, Linda and, got got unfortunately it was released 
uh, during that campaign, her Oscar campaign, that uh, she didn't do a lot of the voices. Uh, so uh, that that hurt uh, Linda Blair's chances. Uh, right. And actually, it went to another uh, child actress. I think it went to uh, Tatum oh, O'Neill. Tatum O'Neill. Tatum O'Neill for uh, yeah, Tatum uh, Paper Moon or something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, um, but there was a lot of body replacement stuff. There's Eileen Dietz did a lot mm -hmm. of um, body doubling for her during a lot of the possession scenes, and Mercedes McCambridge did a lot of the, in fact, most of the voices, along with other people who did voices too. There was a lot of um, a lot of really creative audio sound work in this film too. That was um, that I believe was nominated. In fact. Um, I thought it won, but maybe it did it, win. Yeah. Was, are you related to the guy that? The, yeah. The, if the the editor Buzz Knudsen. The, yeah, the dubbing editor Buzz Knudsen is my oh. or was my cousin. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, that's cool. Good. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. I got uh, yeah nominated. Uh, it was the first horror of... movie to be nominated for best picture. Yeah. Um, uh, Blatty won for the best adapted screenplay, while the sound engineers took for best sound. So those were the only yeah. two uh, awards it walked out with. But I mean, at the time, it was very controversial because no no movie like this had ever been nominated for yeah. any of these kinds of awards. So it, it yeah. really broke new ground. Uh, box office wise, uh, I think Warner Brothers said at one point, if you adjust for inflation, it's their most profitable movie ever. It's their highest grossing movie ever. I certainly know it's on the list of top uh, movie R rated movies uh, yeah. grossing. Um, now, now it's interesting because it's hard for us to, I guess, do a podcast without mentioning Barbie. But um, now Warner Brothers is saying Barbie is their highest grossing movie yeah. of all time. But um uh so look for barbie meets the exorcist coming yeah next they gotta year. do a no. double bill yeah <laughs> double bill of those two if you can the put barbie oppenheimer cyst. with bobby why the hell not the barbie, the the barbie cyst the barbie cyst. yeah, yeah the exactly barbie cyst. <laughs> yeah so barbie um yeah uh okay so um yeah the the performances and i and uh, by eleanor gray i'm glad we talked about that one of the things i wanted to mention too was when i first saw it um, I don't know which order I saw these in or whatever, but I saw these all around the same time. And there was a sort of I call it my sort of the, the trilogy of these like spiritual horror movies. And and you mentioned Rosemary's Baby. That's one of them. Uh, the Omen is the another Omen, one. Yeah. And this mm -hmm. one as well. And these horror movies to me work on an entirely different level than any of sort of the classic horror movies that I was used to growing up. Um, certainly way different than the monster movies, Universal and and we're coming out of Japan and stuff like that. I mean, this is these stuff. This wasn't like this wasn't just like mythical creatures or or creatures that, you know, were exposed to some sort of radiation. These were like these were ones that got under literally get under your skin. Yeah. Um, and 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 in those three movies really focus on children being pawns of this like huge, like spiritual battle. And I wasn't Catholic. I didn't grow up Catholic or anything. I was a Protestant, but still, I mean, I think I, I mean, we went to church every all the time and these, these sort of were, these sort of movies really affected me that way. Um, now, Rebecca, I know you said that you weren't um, that religious, but, um, but did you feel that with those, that this movie was different in that respect? Um, I did in that, um, you know, as I said, I am not a religious person. I didn't grow up particularly religious. I mean, my parents, like we kind of, a, we'd go to church on Christmas and Easter and that was about it. Um, but my relatives definitely were. And um, I remember, you know, they really were kind of against um, stuff like this. I mean, more so because I was born in the 70s. So I'm old enough to remember all the satanic panic of the 80s. You know, right. with hor you know horror movies and video games and rock mm -hmm. music and stuff. So they were definitely <laughs> like, oh yeah, they were very much like they would organize protests, you know, through their church to go, you know, protest the latest Nightmare on Elm Street or Ozzy Osbourne show or whatever. So I was definitely aware that you know, oh, this is, um, you know, this is definitely, as you said, Mike, it's definitely different than you know your typical like Frankenstein and Dracula. And things like that, because I think it definitely affects you on a much more psychological level than just some creature that jumps out of a closet and scares you. I mean, as you said, you know, it's it's attacking not only, you know, kids, but, you know, um, you know, not even your physical being, 
it, but in a sense, but also like your spiritual being, you know, if you, if that's, or, you, or, you, or your very being, kind of, right. <laughs> or your very being. And not only that, but, you know, obviously it's affecting the people around you. And, you know, as we saw with the exorcist, um, this, you know, the demonic possession can jump from person to person if it wants to, or, you know, it can move um, from, from person to person and from, um, you know, it, and from time to, from time and place. And um, yeah, I think there it definitely, I mean, like I said, even now, it definitely does affect me a little bit in that it's, I think this movie still holds up. Um, like you said, you know, 50 years later, we're still talking about it. And, you know, I just watched it last night. And I mean, I watch horror movies don't really affect me other than that. I'm really interested in how they're made. And, um, and, you know, this one is not an exception, but, you know, I did definitely, there were a couple of times even watching it, I, I got chills a couple of times and I never get chills watching horror movies. So <laughs> And I think also, I mean, even if you take the spiritualness out of it, though, I mean, these are this movie is based on like a like real cases. So, I mean, you know, they're it, that have taken sort of a legendary mythic quality to them. But still, you get the feeling when you're watching this, that this is something that could happen. Like, I, I, no matter what is going on, what the whatever the explanation is going on, there's an authenticity to it that I think is that was missing from a lot of the horror movies that I was exposed to before this, I think. Oh, yeah. I mean, Very definitely. Much. I mean, someone could, you could, you know, I guess now you could maybe explain it as a cycle. You're having a, you know, a psychological episode. It's, you know, something exactly. going on in your head. But, you know, that's, it still doesn't make it any less scary. Because that is something that could happen to any of us. Whereas, you know, I mean, as much as I may want to see the creature from the Black Lagoon, you know, <laughs> it, it, probably not going to happen, sadly. But you know. see, I, in my in my worldview, I I don't I have like probably a maybe twenty five percent less than zero um religi religiosity, and so and I never really believed that demonic stuff but this is literally one of my favorite movies um and has been for years i've studied this movie and i and i i like you said um earlier you said you watch it as a fantasy and that's how i watch it and fantasies can be very powerful to me i mean I, this is some of my favorite i mean pretty much every horror movie is something that i don't believe you know Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you, you every I love Stephen King, but I don't read his books and say, wow, that could actually happen. You know, it's a I read them because the 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 the, the mythology and, the, you know, the mythology of it is powerful for me. And I think those are tropes, you know, the Joseph Campbell stuff. You know, you go back to those ancient tropes that have been scaring us since the dawn of intelligence. You know, people have been trying to scare us with magical you know, an invisible person out there. So don't go there. You know, mm -hmm. if I don't want you to steal my stuff, I say that it's protected by a magical being that will tear you apart if you touch my things. You know? <laughs> so that people have always used those kind of mythical stories around the, the and and also the stories of the the omni powerful being that they defeated. You know, I I went out and there was a it wasn't just a bear, it was a super bear. And I, I killed it. You know, those are the origins of horror stories, I think. And, and also the fact that I think we spent most of our evolutionary development being, you know, pre pre human development, being terrified of predators, hiding from predators and learning how to identify predators. And I think whatever, whatever genetic memory we have left in us that, that uh, still kind of has those, um, those feelings i think that's what horror movies give to us is they give us that uh there's something familiar about it something in our genetic memory that makes us think you know predators or i mean it goes back and, to when we are, we're all sitting around a campfire you know as cavemen yeah. and making up stories and i mean we're still doing that now it's just you know we're reaching a bigger audience than yeah <laughs> than just oh, the four or so. five the people in our small tribe, you know, right. well, very much. So it goes back to the cave times when, you know, we were afraid of what was in the dark. You didn't know what was out there, what predators were out there that could hurt us and everything. 
and it yeah. just goes through. And the psych the psychological story of this is just amazing. In this movie, you literally feel the hairs on the back of your neck go up at certain points. There were I was watching this in broad daylight and I still felt like there was <laughs> something behind the chair that I was sitting in watching. <laughs> yeah. And everything. This is and, William Friedkin, I think. Oh no, and he's amazing in this. Yeah. This is just his this is one of his masterpieces. Yeah. And the book, I don't know how many of you read the book um by William Peter Butt Wadley. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um and it goes so into Legion. I, you, yeah, Legion and yeah, you get a yeah, lot more detail with, very you know, good. not only, you know, um the the family with Reagan and Chris, but you also get more, you know, insight into Father Karras and Father Marin and, you know, what Karras is going through with his mother and um, yeah. it's just, and even um, the, um, I'm blanking on their names, but the the couple that, that work for Chris and, you know, the family, you yeah. can get a little yeah, bit more Sharon backstory and... into them. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's just, it, it just makes it, it richer and yeah, highly recommend it if you haven't read it. Yeah. Um, that's uh, um the uh i don't know if it was 25 years or some anniversary um that they did and now i think it's been two decades since then uh but they came up with a sort of director's cut for you can put together another set uh with more footage including the famous spider walk uh yeah. that uh, really? uh that uh yeah. and to be honest with you i know i've seen like clips of the spider walk but i don't know that I've ever actually seen the extended director's cut. I do believe is I know that they're showing uh they're they're showing it in theaters this weekend uh on a uh, I think Fathom Events is doing a special screening before the uh, the new one comes out. Um uh and I think they're showing the director's cut um sort of as a tribute to yeah. William Freakin as well, but um uh have you guys seen it? Is it worth seeing is it is it better is it i can't yeah, remember that's... whether i've seen it or not that's what's <laughs> well, weird i mean i remember the scene a... like you mike i i just saw a little near her going down the stairs but i'm like i don't know man when you got perfection i don't even know if i want to see it you know i, I mean that sounds kind of crappy but yeah well there's I mean, actually I not a lot more added to be honest i have I, I that's what i watched was the director's cuts that's the one that i have on blu-ray and there's right. not i mean it's not like there's it's not like you know the lord of the rings extended edition or anything where there's, <laughs> it's not like an hour you know, longer <laughs> a lot hour longer or anything i mean i think it's just like a few minutes maybe yeah, it's yeah not that just much i mean things. there's that right. famous there yeah it's the famous bit with you know the, her walking doing the spider walk down the stairs and i think there might be a little bit more with um uh uh the mother Paris's mother maybe like it but honestly there's not and it just it looks a little crisper and you know it's cleaned up yeah. a bit more but the version i, mean, I saw uh copy on, i watched on, tonight was yeah you watched the it on max. That's on max yeah it's that's a nice copy good. Oh, that's man. a very it nice copy. i was seeing it stuff also. tonight when i was watching it i saw stuff i'm like oh oh wait a minute Oh, yeah, I didn't the, realize that. The, well, one the of the cinematography things, on this is is amazing. There's more connectors in this film, and and I love the fact that I'm still watching it. This is probably fiftieth, sixtieth, seventieth time I've seen this film, and that's actually low for a lot of movies that I love. Uh, is uh, the fact that the little uh, you know Reagan she she does those little sculpts. And then they go into the church and then there's that heinous thing done to the Virgin Mary or whatever. And I'm like, it looked like it could be sculpted by the same person. Yeah. Which is, and I didn't I even think, think about be, that. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. And the fact that Reagan is never shown outside until the very end, she's always confined in a hospital or that house. Interesting. Yeah. I actually saw the, I've seen so many versions of the film I and I've seen it four times. I've, seen this movie four times with William Friedkin actually oh, wow wow and wow. the director's cut um and and several times with uh, William Peter Blatty as well and and cast and and various crew um just you know living in living in this town you get experience you get the opportunities like that but um the one time we saw the director's cut um it, it was in a screening like a smaller screening room and um 
I got to talk to him about it a little bit and I kind of got to kind of express my not likingness of it to him a little bit <laughs> of what like the director's of, cut of the, the director's, director's cut, cut. because oh, he stuck in he did the you know the subliminal things you know the face that they call Captain Howdy the um right the, oh know, that, yeah that shows up a little bit more doesn't it they yeah. stick it in there yeah. and it shows up on like the side of the refrigerator and it shows up on reagan's bedroom door and it's almost like a like somebody over there with a projector going you know and it's it's not effective <laughs> to me it doesn't um it, it's not it takes it out of scary for me it looks like spook house ride you know kind of thing oh okay huh. and wow. the spider walk is so awkward you can tell that that it, that the physics of it isn't right because they had to do her on they put her on a harness mm -hmm. and, and you know obviously it's not the young actress it was I, I believe a stunt woman that was doing this like you know i don't know contortionist kind of stuff backwards and then the, she runs up to the mom and licks her leg and it's a uh, it just seemed a little bit, it was too much. That scene was so effective uh, without that, this, because the lights are flickering and the phone rings and nobody's there. And and then the whole thing about, you know, Burke's dead. One of my favorite lines in a movie. But uh, two. <laughs> but uh, that, to me, I just didn't like it. And I told, you know, I actually told him that I didn't Ooh. like it so much. And, and uh, he was like, well, to each his own, you know. But, uh, <laughs> like, uh, you know, it's, yeah. I think he was I think he wasn't really too concerned about it at that point. I think it was just another version that they could put out. And I mean, I hate to say it, but it was probably like, you know, they probably, you know, moved some more copies of it and cash grab. Yeah, it was a little bit of that because William Peter Blatty had been talking for years about the original cut that he had seen of the film, which was. I think 35 minutes longer or 28 minutes longer or something like that, which mm -hmm. included the spider walk and included some exposition and some other parts where she talks a little bit more with the doctors. There's a little bit more uh, spiritual talk between the priests out in the hallway in front of Reagan's room. There's a few things that they left out, but it just um, Friedkin, I think wisely took that stuff out because it's almost like you don't too much exposition is I, I don't know it can kind of ruin the mood of something where if yeah. you're if you're left to your own to your own uh, intellect intellect to to determine what is happening what you're seeing on the screen if you're allowed to interpret that yourself it tends to have more resonance i think and i think he's letting us friedkin was letting us see what what was happening and uh, Blatty, being a being a words person, was wanting us to hear the words of what was happening. That was my interpretation. And uh, right. Friedkin did his cut, his director's cut, almost to appease what uh, William Peter Blatty had been asking for all these years, you know. And they worked so closely together on the film, but Blatty was not allowed in editing. Yeah, that's what I understand. Huh. I, I I I I believe when the the final cut was first uh released i i believe the two didn't speak for a while because right. buddy was kind of upset and then took a while and and there was a like look i mean we don't have time to get into even half <laughs> of it but yeah. there's so many stories about the making of this movie and it doesn't sound like it was a very happy set um it took a long time uh there's a lot of like stuff that happened afterwards um uh during the the, the editing process certainly uh, there was a lot of um, uh, discussions about, well, a lot of things that happened with the soundtrack, the sa the score, uh, yeah. tried a couple of different yeah. people that didn't work out. Uh, but then again, you know, I think the, the tubular bells uh, thing oh, worked out great... pretty well for them, didn't it? Oh, God, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the music and the oh, sound through the whole film, the pieces that, of music. That sequence the where, are fantastic. again, we're, we're focusing on the mom, which is interesting because I, I had no idea we were going to do that in this discussion. And it's great because I noticed it, too, last the, during the weekend. But the, where she's just walking down the street and it's the yes. only real moment of calm that you have during the movie. It's like the calm before the storm. Yeah. Um, but Tubular Bells is playing and, and she, you know, the, the the kids in Halloween costumes go by. And yeah. I'm like, I'm like, man, nuns. if this isn't something that that John Carpenter didn't like look and try to recreate in Halloween with. Uh, yes. I, I mean, it just has that same vibe to it. Just like the leaves I, blowing. Yeah. It puts you into place. Yeah. I told I told Burke that my favorite we were talking about the other day when I was begging him, pleading to him to come on the show. 
<laughs> and it was uh and okay. it was the fact that my favorite shot in the whole film and i've actually done illustrations of it before are the two nuns walking yeah, right with, with the with the thing and they're kind of they're backlit so their faces are like black but i just think that it's amazing there is not one one frame in this film that is wrong to me yeah uh we, we you know i've I talked with in the, uh, in the people 73 about theatrical version in the 73 about. theatrical yeah. version I, I agree I, I look at this and there is not one extra moment there's not one it's it's just absolutely perfect all the way through now i've said this before there is no such thing as a perfect film and i still believe that but there is how close can you get to perfection this movie borders on that i, uh, I don't I would agree with that yeah. i don't think there's any way you can tell this story better there's yeah, like, no this is every character in this film is wonderful the guy at the end, at the bottom of the steps, when when Damien has thrown himself down and he's asking him, hey, "Can I give you yeah. your last rites?" and he's holding his hand. I mean, it's a tearjerker. Uh, um, uh, Kinderman, he's a real priest too. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He was absolutely wonderful. Lee J. Cobb. By the uh, yeah, the uh, the uh, the astronaut when she goes, "You're going to die up there," and then she urinates on the on the rug. Yeah. By the way, there's if anybody's ever interested, this is a pretty wacky movie. But if you get a chance, watch the night ninth configuration yes which is supposed to somewhat be tied into that astronaut it's written by story. william peter black yes. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and it yeah but if you if you i mean to me i've i've seen this movie so many times and tonight i was like okay i'm gonna be real serious here i'm gonna watch this son of a gun and everything and oh by the way pauline kale sucks but anyway yeah. uh so i'm watching this thing and i'm like this is a this is as close to a perfect movie as a movie can get. Yeah. 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 I mean, I it's would, like everybody's well, you know. wonderful. I, I love everybody in this film. Everybody in this film uh, is fantastic from I'm Swiss to, you know, to the yeah. to, to Karis to, and I know uh, let's Bloody try real quick. Get a chance, Gordon, let's talk about makeup. If you're going to talk about makeup, let I me was going to bring up, shut up. Yeah. I we, 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 we could do thought a, we Max could... von Sydow was was in his exactly 70, yeah. and then I watched yeah. Exorcist two a few years later. I'm like, hey, wait a minute, where did they get when, this really they, good looking young guy? When, when they announced that Max von Sydow was going to play Bing the Merciless, I was like, he is way too old. Like, He's I was way like, too old. Yeah, no way. it's the single. It might die. be my. I if somebody ever asked me what is your single favorite makeup in the history of film, it ain't the Reagan, it ain't the barfing, it ain't the head spinning around, it ain't all these other films. It isn't even the Jack Pierce Frankenstein. Makeup. It is, it is him as Father Karras. You know, that you know, the, makeup the makeup only that goes so far, the though. Performance. His, his, I was going to say, the makeup only goes so far. And I think yeah. when I was watching it this time, I kind of noticed the makeup more than I did, have ever noticed it. But his performance, he acts like he's yeah. 80 years old. In that. I mean, he, yeah. he's shaking. He's... He's he looks sore. He looks like everything hurts when well, he that, moves. That you it's, could tell it's, earlier it's in the amazing. morning he was more normal, and then when he saw the statue and yeah, everything, yeah. he he becomes doddering. Yeah, I don't yeah, agree. You, with you. I, I don't I agree. With you. We'll, to... we'll arm wrestle for the makeup thing later because <laughs> I think the makeup. <laughs> I, like I've the actually done portraits of him from that. He's so good. A little bit in this one, you know, yeah. what's going yeah. on. And it's I, I was yeah, I was absolutely shocked when I found out he was like what forty four when he filmed yeah. this. I think yeah. he's incredible. Like forty two. Because I was just like, yeah, did he? All, does he always just looked like he's seventy? Because <laughs> it's like you see <laughs> movies, amazing. you see things where he's done, you know, thirty years after doing this, and I'm like, he looks exactly the same. <laughs> you get yeah. out the calculator, and when was he playing death on the beach, playing chess with the guy? I mean, yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. you right. know, I mean, he. Well, he I got to amazing. I was lucky I got to spend some time with Dick Smith and talk to him quite a bit about The Exorcist. And and I think you were saying earlier that uh, you didn't you imagine it was probably a very difficult set to be on. And that was one of the things he went on about, because um, I've I've worked on countless films and most of the time you're fairly comfortable. The crew is made to be comfortable. There are union rules. There's OSHA rules. <laughs> there's safety rules. And that was during those, um, you know, raging bull days of the uh, of the 70s when there wasn't a whole lot of safety stuff. And old time, you know, a lot of these old timers that I talk to are they are hilarious. They're like. Yeah, no, we were, you know, they had those poison pots, smoke pots inside the room with no ventilation, 
all day, all night. We were shooting, you know, 17 hour days. And and Dick Smith was saying the room that Reagan was in, Reagan's bedroom was literally built inside a refrigeration. A fridge, right? A fridge. Yeah. It was a refrigerator. It was like, I don't know if you guys have Costco, but when you go into the produce rooms, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> It was colder than that because they had to get it cold enough to where you could see vapor. You couldn't do that digitally yet, you know, so you had to see the the vapor. And also um, he was saying that they had <laughs> this is horrible, but they had people in there spraying them with uh, glycerin so that they would look like they were sweating while still breathing this va- vapor. So they had like freezing glycerin, you know blocking their pores or whatever you know just gradually poisoning them through the skin and he said yeah it was a it was a nightmare but he said pretty typical of a 70s film <laughs> wow yeah the, i know a uh, lot of people got hurt on this set yeah, too. i know linda both, blair got hurt ellen burston got hurt really bad. yeah they both got hurt by uh poor harnesses uh yeah. harness work and then i think you know to, to, you know, from what I hear, uh, William Freakin's running around with a uh, shooting guns every once in a while just to yeah, keep people like to get reactions, you know, to get reaction shots or whatever. And you never know when he's going to fire off a pistol. And it's just like, my goodness. Uh, yeah. And it took like that. and it took a long time. It was only supposed to take like 80 days to shoot or whatever. And it took like, I think, 200 or something like that. It took like oh, over geez. almost a year. So yeah, they went way over. They went way over. But I asked um, him about the gun and he said, oh, they were blanks. Well, sure, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't care. someone someone comes up right behind you and yeah. fires a blank. Like, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, if you tell me you're going to shoot it, I'm still going to, you know, make me jump. So. All right. So yeah. David Cronenberg it. did that as well in uh, Dead Zone, and, and so sometimes when you when you see Christopher Walken when he touches people and he goes like that, um, they. <laughs> Cronenberg was firing a firing a gun and it was like ooh, you know, you, wow. but of course uh, they replaced the sound so you don't hear the gun so it just sure. looks like a you know <laughs> oh my god uh, moment yeah. so we're getting ready to wind down I have to ask we've got uh you know we've got these this new one coming up the exorcist believer which is coming up I think in another week or so uh it's I believe the sixth movie in this franchise uh there's been uh, a TV series, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Rebecca, I'm going to turn to you first. Is there anything after this one worth watching? Um, I mean, I'm definitely going to check this out. I honestly don't know a lot about the new one other than what I saw at Halloween Horror Nights. Because and Ellen Burstyn is supposed to be uh, reprising and her repri- role. In the- and she's reprising her role, which will be And there's rumors that Linda Blair might be too, but. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've um, I've got actually got tickets for an advanced screening of it next Tuesday, I think, um, and then I'm gonna go see the the uh, anniversary screening on Sunday uh, beforehand. So with some people that have never seen The Exorcist before, Ooh. so that should be fun. Yeah, I'm excited. There, uh, this is this is gonna be interesting. So um, I think I stopped I, after the fourth one. I just didn't really care after that. Um, and even that I, one was I, a stretch. I, so. I, the second one yeah, is, you know, yeah. the third one, I actually, I actually, Exorcist 3, I actually think is pretty good. Yeah. Um, I love yeah. That. And I would recommend that one if, if George C. Scott is great in that. And that's yeah, a very and good Brad, movie. I think it's one Brad Dourif and yeah, yeah. it's, it's pretty good. It's got um, an unfortunate ending though. This, a studio interference type ending, but um there's enough One there. The it's based on Legion. Though. Yeah. One of the best jump scares ever, of any movie yes. ever. Yeah, everybody ever. still talks about that. Yeah. Yes. True. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I believe uh uh yeah, he takes over for the Lee J. Cobb role, right? Because yes. uh, yeah, Cobb is no longer right. but the right. Paul the Paul Schrader and Rennie Harlan, those those are um I can't really recommend those. How come Pauline Kale didn't talk about those? I think she, she had probably did. Probably was, at was that she point. She dead by uh, then? Yeah, she had. She had already. <laughs> I think. Well, already I think. I think certainly the by Georgetown I, stairs. I think. So. <laughs> Stop it! You're making my mouth water. I'm, I'm one of those people that really can't stand Pauline Kael. She hated Raider. She hated Superman the movie. She hated 2001. She hated Dirty Harry. And she now I just found fun. out tonight she hated The Exorcist. So yeah. uh, no surprise. Much useless. No surprise. Uh, no surprise. Uh, Mark, in your opinion, is there anything, are there any, any like follow up with anything? Exorcist just... three is wonderful, except for, as Burke said, the last 10 minutes, which was a studio plug in because they had to have an exorcist. 
exorcism, but the rest of the film is wonderful. <laughs> uh, what's his face from who played the doc on uh, Walking Dead is in it. Uh, yeah. who uh, lived, uh, his mom lived like two blocks from me in Thomasville. So my kids go over there to have a birthday party and who's there. <laughs> What's his face from the, <laughs> from the walking dead doing scratch off. Uh, but he, yeah, he's yeah, in, uh, in he's cold also, blood as well. In cold Scott blood, Wilson. Yeah. Cold blood. He's in the right Scott, stuff, but he's also about Scott in, Wilson. He, yeah. He's Scott also Wilson, in the yeah. ninth configuration Yeah, and, uh, and he, he a wonderful guy. He's not no longer with us, but I, talk with him in an elevator one time and i just said man what do you think about all this people just seem to love me nowadays i mean he was more popular yeah at his age but anyway he was great but um the other ones all of them everyone especially exorcist 2 i've heard people say you know what exorcist 2 has got to be rethought and all that kind of stuff so i sat down i hadn't seen it in 40 years watched it and i was like that is crap yeah, it's not. So that good. is crap. Uh, <laughs> great Ennio Morricone score. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Great, great Ennio Morricone score. But the movie's crap. The the ones that Burke was talking about later are crap. I have. I am very nervous about this. The only thing that would get me to pull into seeing this thing is that Ellen Burstyn's in it. And I, you know what, I would love. I would love to see the reviews and they go, hey. This is fantastic! Oh yeah. my goodness, they finally got it. Okay, I'll I'll be there. But um, it, to me, it just looks like oh, you thought one girl possessed by the devil was scary. How about two? Yeah, you know, it's like <laughs> oh, it they should her. possess the girls from The Shining, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Mike, have you seen any of the follow ups? Uh, any interest? I saw the second one. After that, it was like, nah, this just didn't do it for me. <laughs> Third one's good. You should check it out when you get. A I chance. saw the the second one. I know is on Max. I don't know where the others are, so I can't really recommend. I, uh, I don't the know. third one is on Amazon Prime. Oh, okay, gotcha. So it's, okay. it's actually pretty good. Uh, Scott and everybody else in the movie's good. It's got warmth to it as well as the horror. That's what's mm-hmm. good about it. You know. So, uh, so we'll look to you, to Rebecca, to 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 let us know whether or not that the new one is uh is worth checking out. So, exactly. Uh, we'll, do. Um, we'll 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 cool. follow you and and see. And then, uh, but as far as this one goes, I think we all agree it's a classic. There's still a lot to discuss about this one, and yeah. you know, I'm sure we'll be we will be discussing it. Uh, you know, years from now, fifty more years from now, but. Uh, In the meantime, uh, thank you guys for joining us so much. Um, We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to be back to close out the show. Okay, YouTube folks, this is the bonus part. And it's interesting because we, you know, in the main part of the show, we barely touched on the story for this one. I know. I was and, like, I made like 400 notes, 400 like <laughs> pages Damn, of notes. And I'm like, it. oh, yeah. forget it, Mark. Just just let it go. I had my you know? reference library here, too, of my uh, <laughs> Satanic Panic books. You know, I got the book here. I've got notes. I've got, yeah. I mean, I could have. Yeah. Um, if you guys ever, uh, Mike, if you, Mike's, if you ever decide to do like a a, a spinoff with uh, like ES uh, Air Station Boo, like a horror podcast, let yep. me know. I could we, do we, like I could do like several episodes about just the exorcist. So that's a that's yeah. And I was going to go into the subliminal stuff as well. When I was uh, uh, when I was looking at the uh, the IMDb for this and the, the trivia section, it was like you know I think it was like. 14,000 pages long. Like, it was <laughs> yeah. just like, I was just scrolling, 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 scrolling. Uh, I mean, there's a lot that's been talked about with this movie. Uh, so it is difficult uh, to to cover in a in an hour. But, um, you know, I think we made some good points. I'm glad that we got, you know, we gave Ellen Burstyn some love, especially since she's in a new the new one. Oh, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and it was great because she was, you know, in a lot of ways, she was the soul of the movie and absolutely yeah and it was just interesting you know seeing her her daughter you know slowly grow you know and being taken over and changing and everything and i've seen studies and you know reports you know oh it's a you know a take of a a young woman going into puberty and growing away from her mother and it's just like really i never took it that way yeah this is not this is not a judy bloom book no, it isn't. It's not. It's not. Hot. Hello, God. It's me, Margaret. Or are you? Right. No. Are you? Are you there saying it's me, Margaret? <laughs> hello, <laughs> hello, God. It's it's me, Pazuzu. <laughs> exactly. Hello, God. It's me. Well, it's, it's like 
like Bert <laughs> said, I mean, that's the, the thing is these characters were so real. And, you know, the way that they set it up at the beginning, you see this, you know, sweet little girl and her mom who, her, you know, even though her mom is this busy actress, obviously, you know, is making all this time for her, is there is present for her. You know, obviously she's got an absent dad. She's got these people in her life, you know, that take care of her. And, you know, they're just having this kind of fun, normal life. And then slowly you just see this little girl start to change and no one can figure out why. And it's, you know, it's it's that Ouija board. Mm -hmm. So it's Captain Howdy. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got, you know, the priest dealing with his mom's stuff, you know, that all that and dealing with that grief and that guilt over not being there for her. And it's um, a lot of backstory, which is really it's. It's yeah, it's and then you got these great, so many great little, you know, even the smaller characters. He, like Kinder, I love Kinderman in this. You know, I, I I love film. I love to discuss film, and <laughs> you know, you you're John, you're John Garfield, and body and soul. That's who you are. You know, it's like when he asks Chris for the autograph, and he says it's for yeah. his daughter, and she's like, I lied. Yeah. I'm he's lying. Like, it's for like, me. He, he, he's all, he acts like a little boy. He's like, he's yeah, kind of laughs. He's like. I lied. It's actually for me. I think if I yeah. remember correctly, right around the time after, it was after The Exorcist came out, right after he passed away real quick, and they ended up doing a thing at the Academy Awards where they had on a pedestal an Oscar for him. I don't know if it was Lifetime Achievement or what, uh, but it was one of those where it was like for Lee J. Cobb, and so right. that's the way that they so did great it. that guy and everything. He really 12, 12 was angry so men good. And, yeah. Uh, oh, and on the waterfront. On oh the waterfront. But crap. I, I yeah. actually think to me, Kinderman might be my favorite performance of his, even though it's not a big one. It's critical. He it's is full. actually us. Yeah, he made He's the actually, it, trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. It's yeah, one of those brush strokes kind of characters where you where it's like I always tell people when they're trying to create characters, um there are ways to create characters with a few brush strokes, you know, like um, like in an old master's painting, when you look at it really close, the face is just three brush strokes. But then when yeah. you go farther away from it, it's a fully expression, nuanced face. And characterizations like that are 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 so um, it's hard to do it. But uh, Stephen King does it. He'll you know this yeah. character on page one. Yeah. And I think certain actors can can uh, pull that off and and just just by the way they talk, their mannerisms, the way they move, the way they look at someone while they're talking or the way they listen. Listening is such a huge thing in a in a performance like the way someone listens tells you so much about who who they are. And yeah. Lee J. Cobb is a master at all that stuff. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. He thinks it's also about thinking an actor if they're thinking, if they're, the lines that they're saying aren't just the rehearsed thing that they're spewing out, but they're actually composing in their mind what they're about to say after mm -hmm. you've said what you said, they're thinking and they're like responding, you know, that that subtlety. And this film is full of people like that. Ellen Burstyn and Lee J. It's Cobb. You can study this film if you're it's an fantastic. actor or cinematographer. Yeah. They're yeah. all and they're all grounded. Um, yeah. uh, very, very grounded because there's a reality to everything that I think that that is the key of this. Nobody's yeah. treating it like a silly fantasy. You know, when he's like going wink, wink at the camera, right. everybody's treating it like, you know, this is this is really happening. They're in this world. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the best horror films, I think, have those kind of performances where people take it, take it to that level of I'm I'm taking this seriously, even though, it, you know, Rosemary's Baby, another great example, you know that scene in the phone booth, you know, where Mia Farrow is real. Mia Farrow is sort of realizing I sound like a crazy woman. You know, you see that thought process mm -hmm. in her mind. Right. Right. And that's what makes a horror movie feel real. Yeah. Exactly. Where it ties almost into reality and you're going, this can't be happening. This is not real. You know, this isn't what is in real life. And it's, that's what makes it so amazing. Yeah. That the that the impossible is happening. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what it is, whether you know whether it's somebody you know rising up, uh, levitating off a bed, or you know whatever it is going to be. If it's something that's just like this, shouldn't like my, this is breaking my reality. Because yeah. <laughs> I feel like things like that, nobody really knows what it's like to actually experience something that's radically supernatural. You know, nobody's 
nobody has actually experienced. I mean, in my in my worldview, my beliefs, I don't think anybody's ever really experienced a supernatural demonic possession. You know, that type of that type. I think people have experienced uh, witnessing their loved ones having seizures and epilepsy and things like that, but um, and not knowing what it was, but the nobody or, really or, knows or that how... maybe that the loved one is does believe that they're demonically yeah. possessed and has worked themselves up into a fit mm-hmm. exactly they even yeah. touch on in the movie that they you know yeah. handed that oh it could be some you know i or the doctor was like yeah you know people if you really you know if you already have maybe you're having a psychotic break but you are also very you're maybe a catholic yeah. Right. Could very easily well, that you could actually think that you are possessed by the devil. So in that what, case, what, what's that Italian woodwork? <laughs> what's the Italian horror film where the girl does do the spider walk? It's like 60, 61, 62, a black and white film where she does that same thing. And it's based on a true thing where they had an exorcism. It's an old film. It's way before the exorcist, like a decade before, but it's based on something that happened, I think in Italy before that. And the woman does the backwards thing and, and it's, yeah. and, and she's in a church and they're trying to stop it. And I was like, Holy crap. Some of this stuff's been around before the exorcist. I thought it was sort of, uh, you know, uh, brand new, but, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's been there before, but to me, I'm always, you know, I'm like Haji on Johnny quest. I'm from Missouri. I just, you know, I just, I'm just not, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I'm, I'm worse than everybody else here. I don't believe in anything. There's a lot of tropes that got created in by the exorcist. I think that, I think Rebecca, you mentioned satanic panic. Um, I, I grew up in the South and, uh, in the sort of vortex of that whole idea, I went to a, went to a primitive Baptist school and, uh, was surrounded by people who really believed that there were devil worshiping cults and that the leaders of our, of our politics and, you know, the, of the other side, of course, and the people we don't like, they're all members of devil worshiping cults and the Catholics are all devil worshipers and they sacrifice babies. I could go on and on, but well, now it's um, the Democrats. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're all <laughs> devil worshipers, uh, but the, we're, uh, we're destroying, we're destroying America. So yeah. Cause we, our job. Yeah. Because we're yeah. we're subhuman, <laughs> I think is what. It, yeah. But the those ideas started getting really popular after The Exorcist, and there was people. There was a guy named Mike Warnke and some in that book Michelle remembers, um, where oh, people yeah. were starting to go into these ideas of recovered memories, and um, I I knew somebody who was in prison because his daughters had recovered memories that he w- was in a devil cult and had levitated people. And also some some actually some good friends of mine were in prison for quite quite a long time because they were they were convicted because the prosecutor painted them as devil worshipers and that the victims the West, were, the West Memphis three. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually met yeah. one, one of them. One of the. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I was asked to leave. Uh, I was, I think, a senior in high school and I was made to go home because I was wearing um a, a cure t-shirt oh no uh and this was 1989 <laughs> so but they thought that it was like somehow like a satanic band and i'm like it's the cure yeah. wow <laughs> i mean no I, I could see if i was wearing like you know like wasp or you know molly crew even or something but like come on but, but yeah wow. and this was so, the much fear, of so much fear so much fear of that stuff just, that generates yeah. that and it's, but it's, you know, sadly, it's not really, I mean, you know, it was, you know, I remember when I was a little kid, it was like Kiss, and then later it was Ozzy Osbourne, and then in the 90s, it was Marilyn Manson, and oh, Alice yeah. Cooper, you know, and and now it's, uh, you know, I don't know what it is now, I kind of don't boring. pay attention. But... It's, it's fine, it can it's be anything, I mean, I sat, well, now I it's, sat now in the courtroom it's, Now again, it's, had... you know, the, the people that vote differently than you vote, I mean, it's sure. kind of that, change to that now, so. People who are, who are smarter. <laughs> They, I sat in a courtroom and listened to them recite evidence that uh, that these guys that I had been working with were devil worshippers, and that that was the lyrics to "Don't Fear the Reaper" by Blue Oyster Cult. And you know the jury, um, the jury, a bunch of people from Arkansas were sitting there like, like wow. I can't I can't believe what I'm hearing. This is a song about dying and. So obviously these people are capable of murdering children. And I think a lot of that came from 
you know, I, I mean, I love The Exorcist, but I think a lot of people were really impacted by The Exorcist and sort of took it more seriously than they should. Then people like us who watch it as a fantasy, they watched it as a depiction of reality. You know, the the way they also would watch the Ten Commandments or something. And yeah. and so when they well, then it came out, you know, there was all that stuff about, oh, this film is cursed and it's actually. Yes. You know, it was actually like the devil himself is in the actual film cells. And, if you, you know, watch my it, money. you're in danger. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up and take my money. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's also too around the time that that what it was it was it sixty nine seventy whatever that Time magazine put out the uh, cover is is God dead. Yeah. I don't remember what year that was, but it didn't help. That, it didn't. That, it didn't keep you know keep keep people tamped down. <laughs> I think that issue of Time Magazine makes a cameo in The Exorcist, doesn't it? Isn't it in I, I literally know, in the doctor's office on the table? I maybe thought so. Maybe. <laughs> well, I think yeah, anytime that you know they're like there's you know they were they keep reporting that every year like the number of when they do polls the number of people that you know can't attend church or that consider themselves religion is a little bit lower every year. Oh, I love so, the fact that and now so it's and like I think that obviously I think that definitely scares people. Thirty so percent. Like, 30% yeah, now, now is atheist. For... 30% is atheist. I'm like, yeah. so it, it's probably about time <laughs> now for the next, you know, thing to come out that, um, you know, I, I mean, think there's always, I think there's always going to be people who are really scared of the myths and the stories that, that they're going to, I think, you know, we talked about the caveman days around the fire. I think what would happen was the, the exploiter types, the people that don't really have any empathy for their fellow man would sit around there and have a group of people and they would tell these, these far out stories, these scary stories. And the people that would get up and sort of walk away and say, you know, good night, let them go. And the ones who stay and they're scared, those are the ones that you can get to do your bidding, you know? And I think <laughs> that right. still oh, yeah. kind of works. You know, you weed out yeah. the people yeah. who, who are thinkers, people who can think and they're, they're a little bit skeptical. They, they go away. And the, you know, the handful of people that are left, those are the people that you can turn, you can get into your cult. Those are the people that live in. Those are foreigners or, yeah, you know. Those, those are the people that live in Marjorie Taylor Greene's district. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, like you can get them scared of anybody who doesn't look like you. Those right. those people are bad. They're trying to take away your Christmas decorations and your gas stoves. They're, but they're, see, <laughs> what, what I found interesting, too, is like, like I said, when I was looking at like, you know, so here it's been 50 years and and like, you know, like a lot of people today are like, oh, yeah, I watched it. It was boring. It was tame. It was this <laughs> or that or whatever. Um, we've got a new one coming out. And, and you know, I wonder if anybody's really even going to care, you know, that you Ellen know, so I, have in never, it or, I have or... never heard anybody say that about The Exorcist, though. I mean, I've definitely heard it about other horror movies. Like I had somebody tell me the other day that you know they tried to watch some of the universal horror movies like frankenstein and dracula and they're like you know it's boring i had to shove off after like 10 minutes i'm like um well Ooh. okay you, Ooh. you're lame but yeah. all right but, um, uh, but, but i've never this, heard anybody but that's also say the problem with a lot of the younger people today things that we get scared by like the exorcist things like the universal movies and such has been parodied so much. Yeah. Like a lot of the stuff they've seen, it's been watered down. Well, so I also tell much. people tell me they won't watch movies that are black and white. So oh, yeah. I've seen, I've, I've, I've known people that have proudly said that. And there's the same people that said proudly after I got out of high school, I never had to read again. And I'm so happy about that. I'm like, <laughs> you go, man, you go. You know what? It's <laughs> like that when I hear that, I'm like, life. that's okay. More black and white movies and books for me. Yeah. 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 I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you're the reason that TCM is dying. Um, yeah, the, uh, exactly. um, yeah. I mean, I, it's yeah. sad when I hear yeah, that. That's another, that's another episode, Mike. <laughs> oh, it, yeah, really. It totally is. And it's interesting. Yeah. Too. We did, we do our film noir episode. Oh, God. Ah, yeah. That's my, that's my, uh, area of expertise oh yeah i live right in film noir land here i got i got actual locations within walking distance from nice. some pretty classic movies that is awesome man very cool. cool so youtube folks you got more than you were expecting today. <laughs> <laughs> is this episode still going i thought you yeah. guys said uh, no no this oh right wait a minute. i didn't realize hey <laughs> i thought we were just chatting hey how's yeah. it going this is our bonus so bonus wow. 
So yeah, I should have said better stuff. Much, I'm sorry. But how how much of a bonus was this? Let, me, yeah, really. Let me straighten my tie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, straighten my ahead. black t-shirt. Let's straighten go ahead and close shirt, up the show yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, straighten my black t-shirt. That's what I'll have on. Yeah, really. <laughs> So that's going to wrap up another episode of the Earth Station One podcast. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Mr. Maddox, thank you as always, my friend. Thank you so much for having me on. It was great. I, I love doing the Halloween episodes. And uh, thanks for having me on for this, you know, discussing this great film. I appreciate oh, it. Very much so. Anything you want to promote or shout out about, sir? Well, Frankenstein, the true story, <laughs> the epic saga behind. I, mean, I know all of you have seen this thing on Facebook the last couple of days. Oh, yeah. But the uh, I did the front and the back it. cover and a bunch of artwork from previous uh, iterations of this. The only thing that makes me sad is that, and you know this, I don't know if you guys talked about this already on the show or not, but it seems like we lost David yes, McCallum this week. We did. Yes, we did. Yes. And that is, yes. that is a massive loss yes. to me. Um uh, anyway, to me, the thing is with David McCallum is I know you guys, and I don't think I'm going to be able to do it, is the H.P. Lovecraft episode for Halloween is that he was, before I ever read an H.P. Lovecraft story, I had audio books of, of him reading H.P. Lovecraft, and he right. was excellent at it. Yeah, I love him in so many things. Hell Drivers, The Great Escape, Man yeah. from Uncle frankenstein the true story which he is superb in and yeah. uh you know um outer limits outer limits yeah. thank you very much <laughs> yes absolutely uh and two episodes as a matter of fact one of yes. them was like a proposed tv series um so it's a massive loss but anyway the book about frankenstein the true story i'm proud to be a part of it to me in my opinion it's one of this four or five great horror uh television movies uh, of all time uh and it was a big success when it came out and so there's a big book of it coming out by sam Irvin. it's actually out you can get it on amazon it's like but an awesome at book. the same time thank you and at the same time i'm just sad about david mccallum being gone yeah so it's weird so it gets yeah. funny, to him. a lot of younger people just know him from ncis yeah right. yes they, they including don't know my, including my girlfriend that's it's just it you know wow. I, I want to, I got to spend him. a few days in the same room with him. I talked to him for like probably a total of 40 seconds. Super nice guy. And he sounded like Edward G. Robinson. Get away from me, kid. You bother me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Security. <laughs> Thanks for staring at me. Humor. No, yeah. but I, I love David McCallum. I really yeah. do. I'm We've sorry already he's gone. Good, long, good, long life. The guy had 90. Sure. Very much. 90. So. 90. Exactly. And Rebecca, thank you, my dear. Oh, well, thank you as always. Um, I'm always happy to talk to you guys and always happy to talk horror. So I'm glad to come back. And again, if you ever decide to do a horror spinoff, uh, I'm your gal. Let's talk about it after the show. <laughs> that might not be a bad idea. What, uh, what's your next show? What do you got? Um, well, my business, uh, Monster Kid ATL, uh, who, uh, which uh, have a lot of great uh, vintage horror toys and games and model kits. Um, I'm going to be at uh, Spookala down in Tampa next weekend. And uh, then I will be at the Little Five Points Halloween Festival uh, uh, here in Atlanta. And then uh, the weekend before Halloween, I will be at Monsterama, uh, which is a very cool little uh, classic horror convention. Very so you're cool. just sort of taking it easy, not very, not. No, it's just not, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't work that hard. Just, this, is, this is my busy season. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That is awesome. And Burke, you made it through your first episode with us, man. Yeah, thanks for putting up with me. Oh, dude, you were awesome. You were great. I hope I, hope I contributed. I, Absolutely. I, I do tend to yammer, as they say. Oh, that's a, that's a plus in podcasting. That's, that's why we have Maddox on the show. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, it was favorite. good to meet all of you guys, except for Maddox, who I've known since for, I think, a couple of... I think we were we, 15. Yeah. 15, 16. Yeah, so it's not 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 fun to meet Maddox, but fun to meet all you guys. <laughs> Gee, it's, it's fun to have someone else pick on him for once. Good. You tired? You tired, Faber? Oh, always, <laughs> always. Anything you want to shout out about or promote, sir? 
Um, yeah, well, I have a I have a podcast about movies, and uh, it's called Cinemondo. Um, we've been doing it for a long, long time, and and it's it and it's still fun. And uh, and I have a, another music podcast called Confusing and Ambiguous, which is what it is to talk about music, I think. But check out Cinemondo. Cinemondo is, uh, I think, it's right up your alley. I think. Oh, it sounds awesome. It does. Yeah. Sound- we go way back. We actually published, uh, speaking of Atlanta, um, I lived there for about seven years, about 40 years ago. And in the 80s, uh, my friend Kathy and I published a magazine called Cinemondo in Atlanta. And um, we got fairly popular. It was pretty popular. And then many, many, many years later out here, she lives out here. My friend Mark, who used to live in Atlanta, all of us kind of migrated out here to L.A., and not to, you know, about maybe five or six years ago, Kathy said, we should resurrect Cinemondo as a podcast. Ooh. So it, it had its origin in Atlanta. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I'll definitely have links to it up on our show notes and everything. So we, did, we did some uh, Star Trek episodes uh, on offshoot, yes. I guess, uh, of the classic Star Trek. We've done, uh, you, you guys did a bunch of episodes. I've been on several of them been a lot yeah we were going to try to do an episode for every episode of star trek and uh, we they the time <laughs> between them kind of got longer and longer and we're still going to do it but uh it's just we, we're gonna the time has to be right <laughs> yeah. yeah that's awesome cool. that is awesome and mr mike we've made it through another one my friend we did and as always it's my pleasure Anything you want to shout out about, sir? Oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, Rebecca already uh, mentioned it, but uh, I need to talk about Monsterama. Uh, the theme this year is uh, Sinbad and the Eye of Monsterama. There is some Sinbad heavy programming there. Uh, well, they have uh, Patrick Wayne as a guest, as well as Carolyn Monroe. Um, big headliner, Star Trek related. Uh, Star Trek's to the Wrath of Khan director, also the director of Time After Time and various other movies and writer of Sherlock Holmes stories. Nicholas Meyer will be there. Very excited about that, um, as well as a bunch of other guests. I am a track director in charge of programming. So I'm uh, working right now on a lot of different panels that we're doing. Um, it's going to be pretty fun. Uh, we've got some great stuff lined up. It is, uh, the weekend of, uh, uh, October 27th through the 29th. So it's at the end of the month. Uh, perfect for spooky season. Perfect way to end the month. Um, it's going to be awesome. Uh, glad to hear you're going to be there, Rebecca. That's going to be pretty cool. I might pull you to you on some panels. Uh, our good oh. friend J.R. Mounts is going to be there. There's some other familiar faces going to be there as well. So, uh, check it out if you're in the Atlanta area and uh, we'll post links to it in our show notes and I'll be posting all about it this month as well. It's the only year I've missed. I wow. know. And I want to go through. That's why it. I agreed Ooh. to do programming this year because I was oh, like, oh, Mike's not well, there. not going to be there, so it'll be fun. Yeah, exactly. I am. Yeah. This is the one. We're gonna year, get to watch it, it get drunk and dance on the dance to you know on the dance floor drunk. That's hey. gonna be sad. Now, now, Rebecca, I can dance, can I? I mean, well, anyway, let's let's end it there. Kind of You're there. terrible. I, All right. I, I, oh, anyway, so anyway, it was it was, but I'm I'm sad, but yeah, it's the same. I'm sad you're not our be Halloween you. party. Yeah, I mean, but next year we've already got it maneuvered to where it'll be off of our Halloween party weekend. Linda and okay. I have a, our party, so that's mm-hmm. it. I'm going to be sad to miss it also this year. Sadly enough, yeah, I'll be but, uh, traveling. So, but uh, I am, uh, yes, I'll hold down the fort. Of course. Thank you. Of course, of course. Send me pictures. My shout out real quick is uh, one of my favorite TV shows that I've been currently watching is coming to an end this week over on FX. Um, It's called The Reservation Dogs. And it is an amazing, amazing TV show. Um, Basically, it's about the indigenous teens, youth, um, on the reservations in Oklahoma and just their everyday lives and everything. And it's not, it's not your typical sitcom. It's not your typical drama. It is pure. It gets into the culture of growing up as an Indian a native American and today's society. And it's really, really amazing. Uh, it's all starring, all in 
native cast and it's also written and directed and created pretty much by um creators and it's just amazing um the staff and everything and the stories they come up with and the first three seasons flew by and it's just amazing they're 10 episodes each and they're definitely worth watching and i know a lot of folks aren't um a lot of big fans of uh taika with td and he basically is the executive producer on it and he let them have free reign on this to do what they wanted to do and it is just awesome and it's the first uh, tv series to be filmed entirely in oklahoma for the first season they went actually went out to california for the second season at towards the end of it and it's it's just it's just a great great story and it's a great series so i definitely will miss this one and you know it's it's just awesome so definitely check it out if you get a chance all right folks that is going to wrap us up for another week and another exciting adventures and spooky and got more spooky next week folks so it's going to be pretty fun with that Thanks for listening to the Air Station One podcast. Always remember, we couldn't do this without you. If you want to support the podcast, please check out our T Public store and get at some really cool ESO Network swag. Also, remember, if you want to help support the show before the rest of the world, why not check us out on the ESO Network Patreon? All you have to do is for as little as a dollar a month, you can help support us here at Air Station One. Check out patreon.com slash ESO Network. We want to hear from you, of course. Please write us anytime at feedback at earthstation1.com. Remember, you can also find Earth Station One wherever fine podcasts are found. And now, of course, Earth Station One can be found in video format up on YouTube. And as a little bonus for watching us up on video, we now have bonus material only available for our YouTube channel. And it doesn't cost anything, folks. It's all free. Why not check it out? You know, folks when uh, who listen to us on audio... When we take a break, you know, for you guys to listen to Ashley, Angela, and Michelle's segments, you know, we do extra bonus stuff for the YouTube folks. So it's actually kind of fun. And as you folks on YouTube for this episode, we went places I didn't even expect that topic to go to. So it's always fun with that. If you made it this far into the video or into the podcast, why not, you know, hit the subscribe button? Seem to enjoy it. So please, we'd love you guys to subscribe. And always, you know, give us a thumbs up or like or leave feedback. We would always appreciate that. On behalf of myself, of course, Mike Faber, Mr. Mike Gordon, Rebecca Perry, Mark Maddox, and of Burke Sauls. Thank you so much for joining us, folks. We couldn't do this without you. We'll see you here next time on our station one. Peace. And you remember, if you see shadows creeping up behind you, be afraid. All right, we're done. Peace. You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek.